Malachi, the last chapter of Malachi, uh, right before we start the New Testament. Obviously, there's something like 400 years between Malachi and, and Matthew, but it's really neat how we just kind of are left with this. Like the next thing to look for is Elijah coming on the scene, right? It's, it's just what it says, uh, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So here we have uh, just the, this, this uh, prophecy to Israel saying, hey, just keep waiting, and Elijah's going to come. Remember, they don't really know who the Messiah is going to be, what he's going to look like, how it's going to... Is he bringing judgment with them? That one day he will, but the first time he came, a little different than they expected. Like they expected, hey, the day of the Lord and judgment, and basically, you know, he'll come and redeem Israel, but he'll just he'll just destroy the rest of the world, all the Gentiles. Well, that's not exactly what Jesus had in mind, the way that they they thought it was going to go. Uh, so this gap that you have between Malachi and Matthew, um, you know, you don't hear a lot about that. But then once you get on the scene. In Matthew, of course, you got uh, uh, the birth of Jesus Christ and all, but depending on what gospel you read, some some of the gospel accounts start with John the Baptist, like right off the bat. Especially, uh, you know, we talk about John one and and all, all of these. Uh, really, if you look at the gospel, everyone is, starts off pretty much with John the Baptist. So, what does John the Baptist have to do with Elijah? All right, we, we're kind of going through a series on Elijah. We're pretty much done. We went through the life of Elijah, but I wanted to continue that. With something, and I think I probably mentioned this towards when we did sort of the introduction to the life of Elijah. Some of the points that I'm going to go over, uh, we kind of already looked at a little bit. But I think it's important to see that the spirit of Elijah continues. That's the title of the message. The spirit of Elijah continues, and I think that uh, that's important to see. Probably we'll just do one more. I'm thinking possibly two, but probably just one more sermon uh, as we talk about. I guess you could say the spirit of Elijah after he's taken up in the whirlwind, okay? So uh, if you would, go to 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. Just keep in the back of your mind. We probably won't go back to Malachi, but keep in the back of your mind that promise or prophecy. 2 Kings chapter 2. Now, we read this last time, uh, two weeks ago, we talked about why uh, uh, the importance of an Elisha. And I would have probably mentioned this one, chapter 2, verse 15. And when the sons of the prophets, which were in view at Jericho, saw him, talking about Elisha, not Elijah, but Elisha, his, uh, his servant. They said, the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. Now this phrase, the spirit of Elijah, it's used a couple times. And the, the, the principle is used you know, several times in the Bible, this, this idea about his spirit or basically Elijah coming back. And we'll talk about that, but, but basically that is referring to the spirit of Elijah. And it's something that's used quite a bit, and it's pretty... Uh, uh, you know, it's pretty isolated to just Elijah. We don't see that used a whole lot. I'll give you a couple examples, though, of, of similar passages. Look at 1 Corinthians 5. Hold your place in 2 Kings. Actually, you could probably lose it. I think we're done in 2 Kings. 1 Corinthians 5. You know, sometimes it's just a, a side thought here. Sometimes... In fact, probably most of my preaching, we use like, we just jump around through the whole Bible. It's not just, I love expository preaching. And, you know, that's what we're, I'm doing a couple books right now that are kind of expository, like Hosea on Sunday nights. <clears throat> expository preaching, more like you'll go through a book and you'll just go thought by thought or even chapter by chapter or whatever. Uh, you know, but most of my preaching ends up being instead of just this expository, just focus on one area. Or even when I do expository preaching, I'll like refer to other books of the Bible. And sometimes like we're all over this place looking at the whole Bible. And it's really so neat when you think about it, because it's not like just one person wrote this, this book. And so you're just like, okay, well, that makes sense. You know, he's going to talk about that here and there. We're talking about like 40 different authors. 
And so, you know, they didn't even know each other really, hardly any of them. They didn't even live in the same time period, a lot of them. And so uh, it's interesting when you see one guy just kind of picks up and refers to something that, you know, uh, matches so closely to something that in another Bible, uh, another part of the Bible that might have been written a thousand years earlier or, or 500 years earlier or whatever. And so it's really cool that we can see so much of this just, you know, uh, whenever we look through the whole Bible, just compare Scripture to Scripture, and we just see the consistency of the Bible. All right, but in the second, uh, no, what did I say? 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5, 5, look at verse 3. For I verily as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. So this goes back to that popular passage. We've used it a lot. Um, uh, I think it's an important scripture to, to churches to, to understand this chapter. But in this chapter, he's talking about this guy that was caught in fornication, and he hasn't been there. He hasn't talked to the guy. He's just heard all the accusations and uh, had several people probably talk about it. And he's like, man, I am not there, he said, but I am present in spirit, and I've judged already. And verse 4 says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit, with the power of our Lord, Je uh, Lord Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ... Now, he's not being weird. He's not saying like, you know, I'm going to have I'm going to be right there like I'm going to be watching you. I'm sending my spirit like, you know, that's it could be kind of considered weird whenever you read that. He's not saying that. He's saying, you know, we kind of say that in passing a lot like, "Hey, I'm with you in spirit." Well, you're not really, but the idea is like, "Hey, uh here's another thing I hear a lot like, my thoughts are with you." That sounds weird. I don't even know what that means. But when we say it, we know what it means. We're saying, "Hey, you know, just Act as though I'm there. It's, it's like I'm there. Just be, you know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's, like I'm, it's, it's like I'm present with you, even though I'm not present with you. And so this is kind of used one time of the Apostle Paul, where he says, you know, I'm with you in spirit. Uh, so we could, you know, kind of make an, a, a, you know, a, a, a comparison there, where Paul's talking about his spirit. Other than that, you know, the Bible talks a lot about how God will stir up the spirit of a certain individual, and basically allow them to be able to do something great for the Lord, but all, it's not really His Spirit being on somebody else or being with somebody else. It's just God stirring up their spirit so that they can do something, right? But the only exceptions to this would be, one of the big exceptions to this would be the spirit of the Antichrist. Look at 1 John 4. And I and I may have been missed. I may have missed some things. Maybe you can think of something and share that with me later. But I'm I don't see anywhere else where that same uh, same type of wording is used. The spirit of Elijah rests upon Elisha. That kind of an idea. But here's what we see in First uh, John four three. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and now, and even now, already is in the world. Okay, so now here it's talking about the spirit of, you know, Antichrist. And uh, that's an interesting, you know, we'll have to, I could preach a whole message about that. All right, so this is a little, little different. And there's one other that I'll talk about at the end of the, end of the message. But basically, I just want you to see that this phrase, spirit of Elijah, and the way in, in which it's used, the manner in which it's used, is pretty unique. But in Matthew 4, he said, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Okay. So the first thing I want to show you is the, the spirit of Elijah continues. The first thing I want you to see is that it continues with John the Baptist. Now look at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Now, it seems kind of weird because you've got this guy, Elijah. He's only there in a few chapters, and he comes on the scene. No one really even knows who he is. He's just Elijah the Tishbite. Well, what's a Tishbite? We don't even know. You know, and all of a sudden he's like praying that the, God would shut up the rain and Israel's goes without rain. Ahab's like, hey, are you the one that troubleth Israel? We just know very little about the story. It just it kind of just jumps out of nowhere. And then a few chapters later, you know, he's off the scene and we're talking about Elisha. And yet, we have here in the New Testament, you know, many years later, 
a reference back to this story in Malachi where he says, the, I will send you Elijah. Okay, so Luke 1, look at verse 17. And when they heard, uh, let me see here, Luke 1, 17. <clears throat> and he shall go, well, let me back up a little bit, actually. Uh, let's go to uh, uh, verse 13, okay? Zacharias finds out that they're having a baby in their old age. But the angel of the Lord said, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. And that is the New Testament equivalent of Elijah in the Old Testament. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the, uh, to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So he's quoting back to Malachi now, and he's saying, you know, hey, this is the Elijah that's supposed to come, and he's supposed to prepare the way for the Lord. And we know that Elijah, I mean, uh, we, John the Baptist did that. And he said, uh, uh, you know, prepare ye the way of the Lord. When Jesus comes on the scene, he says, you know, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. He prepared the way and he pointed people to Jesus. And uh, and we, again, don't see a whole lot about John the Baptist. We see him, obviously, in all the four Gospels, but we only see him, you know, for a few chapters. And then we know he gets his head cut off and we know that, you know, you don't see a whole, whole, mu whole, whole bunch about him after that. But he did his job. He came on the scene. He fulfilled what he was supposed to do. He was faithful unto death. And he, uh, and he pointed the way to Jesus. Now, look at Matthew 11. I'm going to go back and forth between the gospel accounts, just out of convenience here. But Matthew 11, verse 14. And again, I'm going to actually back up a little bit. This is where Jesus talks about John the Baptist. And uh, go to verse 7. So you're in Matthew 11, 7. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? Right, so you got this guy. He's not like this little wimpy wee, uh, a reed of a man. He's a strong man. You know, he's a bold man. Probably got big old hairy legs. <laughs> strong back, you know. Why jaw? I mean, some of these things you can't help, right? But I'm just saying, like, this man was recognized as being a manly man, not a reed shaking with the wind. But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? I mean, he wasn't into the whole, uh, you know, just the soft clothes and the, you know, the pretty, you know, attire and, uh, you know, the, the flamboyant clothes <laughs> that you see the uh, today. Uh, um, I was going to make fun of lavender shirts, but I wore a shirt the other day that was kind of borderline pink. And then I looked up and Brother David had one on too. And I was like, Whew, I'm not alone. <laughs> All right. But it wasn't pink. Okay. It was salmon or something. But <laughs> what went ye out to see, uh, forth to see? A man clothed in soft raiment. Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. All right. He denied pleasures of the flesh. He denied all those things. And he just, you know, he was just a simple man. He was a strong man, and, uh, and he, he was the mouthpiece of God. I say unto you, I'm sorry, but what when you had to see a prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it was written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from that day, uh, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and violence taketh it by forth, force. But all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if ye receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He that hath, an ear, hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now you might read that and say, oh, maybe, you know, reincarnation is true. <laughs> Here's... 
John the Baptist. They're like, look, here's, I mean, here's uh, John the Baptist, and he's saying, hey, here's Elias. Hey, you, you, here's Elias. You know, this is the Elijah that was that, that God said was going to come, and, and here he is. Somebody might say, hey, that's reincarnation. That's not what we're talking about. You know, you have to read between lines sometimes. The Bible, and Jesus talks about a lot of things, and he spiritualizes. You remember when he said, you know, unless you eat my flesh, you drink my blood, you can't see the kingdom of God. And so what do people do? They're like, oh, that's gross. And, the, and then the Catholicism says, you know what, I guess, I guess when we drink that, that wine and we eat that bread, it, it really becomes his body, right? Because he's not here for us to eat his body. So, and they make it so literal, and it's just like, no, it was, it was symbolic. He was just using a graphic picture to teach them something, and he spiritualizes a lot of what he says. Those are called parables, right? In the Bible, Jesus uses a lot of parables where he spiritualizes something. So this idea of John the Baptist being Elijah... I believe is just a spiritual way of saying like he's come in the spirit of Elijah. And what does that mean? Was there some weird like his that spirit was imparted into John the Baptist? No, it just I think it just means that, you know, he was very similar to him. And uh, I'll just kind of go into the next part here. So uh, so let's look at. OK, well, actually, let me explain it this way. Uh, OK, you're in Matthew 11. Go to Matthew 17. Matthew 17, verse 10. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listeth. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer, these, uh, suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Again, he spoke in sort of a, a parable, okay? But I want to explain it this way, just kind of like by way of example. So there are other characters in the Bible uh, that we might, we might call somebody the name of that person in the Bible. Okay, here's an example. Somebody will be like, hey, don't be a Thomas. What does that mean? Don't be a, a doubter, right? Because every time you see the name Thomas in the Bible, the disciple Thomas, it seems to be associated with some form of doubt. You know, he doesn't really want to believe. And I'm not saying he wasn't saved, but he's just having trouble, like living that life just of faith. Thomas, don't be a Thomas, right? You could say, hey, don't have the spirit of Thomas. It doesn't mean you really have his spirit. It's just a, a poetic kind of way of saying it. That's what I believe uh, is talk we're talking about here. Or how about this? Don't be a Judas. What do they mean? Hey, don't betray somebody. Don't be a traitor. Don't stab somebody in the back. Don't be a Judas. You know, that's what people will say. Uh, and we have a lot of people, you know, maybe not even in the Bible that will say that to in our just regular terminology. I used to say, I have a name I haven't heard for a long time, but I used to say, don't be a Bene Benedict Arnold, right? <laughs> I mean, meaning don't be a traitor, you know, because if you know the story about Benedict Arnold. <clears throat> so I don't believe, obviously, that, that, Elijah, I mean, John the Baptist was literally Elijah. And I don't, don't believe that he just got some supernatural, like, imparting of the Spirit, you know, like, how does that even work? Because once you're dead, you know, your spirit goes to be with the Lord. And so it's not like God just sent the Spirit down in a supernatural way. I, I don't believe that. I believe it just simply means, it's kind of like a poetic way of saying it was like him. Okay, so that brings me to my second point. The Spirit of Elijah continues it. We saw it continuing with John the Baptist, but not only that, in a similar way, the spirit of Elijah continues in those who are similar to Elijah. Simply put, they do the same types of things that Elijah did. Now, if you notice, uh, even Jesus, who he and John the Baptist were pretty close in age, all right, but even uh, when Jesus rises on the scene and everybody's pointing to him, he has disciples and all that, some people are even confused about him, and they even begin wondering if he's John the Baptist or, you know, it's, it's weird how they, uh, I don't know what was going through their head, but look at Matthew 16. <coughs> Matthew 16, in verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, 
and others, Jeremiah, are one of the prophets. It's like, why would they say that he is one of these old prophets that's not even alive anymore? You know, it's, it's kind of weird that they thought that way. But why did they get that? Like, why would they say, by the way, John the Baptist was dead by this point. So, uh, he, so that, why would they say, you know, hey, some people think you're John the Baptist. And then in the next breath, or maybe some people think you're Elias or Elijah. Okay, so what did John the Baptist and Elijah and Jesus have in common? Well, one of the things is the way that they preached. All right. Now, this is interesting because when you see, you know, a representation of Jesus, you know, maybe you watched one of those Jesus shows, you know what I mean? I don't recommend them, okay? But there are some show I see advertisements to all the time where Jesus is just this very soft-spoken guy, is just uber-loving and compassionate, which, you know, Jesus is loving and compassionate. But what they fail to show is how he would scold people and how he would preach. And sometimes it would be harshly. Sometimes the words that he preached would hit really hard and they would cut people to the point where they, you know, would either accept that and break down and, uh, and repent or they would, you know, just lash out on him and be mad. And ultimately he ends up being put to death, right, for some of the things that he said. Look at Matthew 3. Let me talk a little bit about the preaching of John the Baptist first. Matthew chapter 3. In verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism... He said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. And think not to say within yourself, ye of Abraham to our, fa to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children of Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. And he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So pretty interesting. They're looking at, you know, this man, John the Baptist, who's just this rough guy, and he's yelling at them. And, and uh, you know, some of them are asking, hey, what do we do? How do we, you know, how do we change our lives? And, and, uh, and all that stuff, because he's preaching repentance, right? He's coming saying, hey, He's talking to, by the way, Jews that were, you know, already looking for the Messiah. So for all practical purposes, most of who he talked to of the, of, Jude, you know, of the Jews there were gathered together. They're waiting on the Messiah, which means they're saved, right? They're just waiting for him to come so, they can, so that they can see who he is. But he's talking to save people then, save Jews. And he's saying, hey, you need to repent. You need to get right. You need to prepare yourself because the Lord is coming and, we're gonna, uh, and he's got a kingdom to build. Okay, so, so, uh, so John is preaching harsh, harshly like that, but then he says, hey, there's somebody coming after me who's going to fan the flame. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean by fan the flame? You ever started a fire, like that campfire that we had the other day, right? It starts dying out a little bit, and all you can see are these embers and coal, or these coals that are you know, just kind of, they're still there, they're still working, but, they're, but the, there's no more heat, there's no more flame. So you might throw a few uh, uh, logs on the fire, and then, uh, you know, just get something and just start fanning that or you get down there and blow on it. And that fan or that air will just make it hotter and it'll make it just kind of start, start growing. Well, he's saying, look, Jesus is going to come and he's going to baptize this world by the Holy Ghost and with fire. Right? And so he comes, of course, we know that that's primarily talking about his next coming. All right. But even whenever he come, you know, he was, uh, he was, he, he didn't hold back anything. Look at, uh. Oh, yeah, this is more John the Baptist preaching. Look at Mark 6. Mark 6, look at verse 17. All right, let's go, let's see, actually, uh, let's go to verse 14. And King Herod heard of him... Uh, for his name was spread abroad, and he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Okay, so he sees, he hears about Jesus, and he's saying that, oh, this is John the Baptist come back from the dead. 
Others said that it is Elias, and others said that it is a prophet or as uh, one of the prophets. But when Herod heard, of, heard thereof, he said, it is John whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. Now we're going to hear about how he got, how he was killed, how John the Baptist was killed. For Herod himself has sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother uh, Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. So you see this idea, he got up in the king's face, the king, and he said, Hey, you're not supposed to be doing that. It's not lawful for you to have the, uh, your brother's wife. Now, this made him mad, no doubt, but he could live with it. He could be, yeah, the guy's just preaching. He's doing his job. But who did it make mad? It made his wife, Herodias, mad. Well, here's an interesting parallel here. John the Baptist, I mean, uh, Elijah, you know, kind of had the same rela relationship with Ahab. Ahab could handle some of the preaching. I mean, he got mad at him. He didn't really like some of his preaching. But who, really, who it really made mad was Ahab's wife, Jezebel, <laughs> right? And then she went after him. And so, look, the preaching makes people mad. And the preaching, sometimes in churches, it seems like, the ones that get the maddest are women. I don't know why that is, but that's the case. All right, sometimes preaching to women, uh, the women will get mad. And uh, a lot of churches I've been in, you know, this is why I think there's a lot of wisdom. This isn't anything against against women or putting women down or anything like that. But there's a lot of wisdom in the Bible. We believe the word, Bible is the word of God, right? The final authority. And in the Bible, it says that the women are to be silent in the church. Well, I've been to a lot of churches where they would have a business meeting or something like that, and the women would be the ones just breathing down each other's necks and, you know, <laughs> grabbing each other by the throat. Not really, but, <laughs> but uh, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> but they, because they're very, very passionate, very uh, emotional, and very like uh, they've got that mother, you know, that mama bear, you know, they're going to jump out and try to. So, hey, let the guys handle it was what, is what the Bible Bible says to do. And there's reasons for that. Okay. But a lot of times that's true. The preaching, you know, if you're hitting on something, uh, you know, about the family or something like that. And that, that a lot of times the woman will come mad because like, Hey, what is he doing? He's accusing us of something. Well, he's just preaching truth. That's all it is, but it'll make people mad. It made John the Baptist, uh, I mean, Herodias mad and got John the Baptist killed. You know, it made, uh, Jezebel mad and she wasn't able to kill Elijah, but she sure tried. And not only that, uh, Jesus is preaching, made a lot of people mad. Look at Matthew 23. Matthew 23. Here's a message that you don't often hear. You know, a lot of times people will preach about how he told the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. Supposedly, we don't really know the whole story, but that's what was said. And he said, uh, you know, uh, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Uh, you know, they said, hey, shouldn't you stone her? And he said, hey, let he who was without uh, sin cast the first stone. A lot of people look at that and say, oh, look how loving and merciful he is, which he is. There's no doubt about it. But a lot of times they'll skip over preaching like this. Matthew 23, starting in verse 13. This is Jesus preaching. He says, woe, un uh, but woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that enter, uh, enter to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, uh, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind. Oh, Jesus calling people fools? That's not very Christ-like. Wait a minute, he is Christ. For whether it is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. And whosoever shall swear by the altar... It is nothing, but whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gift or the altar. This has, anyway, he, he goes on here. I think I read, did I read that twice? And so he's going on there and he's just preaching. He's just letting them have it. Now, here's the significant thing here. A lot of times we can, uh, as preachers, we can pick on somebody who is easy to preach against or somebody who doesn't have the power to do anything 
back to us. But do you understand who Jesus is preaching to right here? This is the scribes and the Pharisees. This is the respected church leaders. This is the, you know, kind of, if there's any type of government among the Jews at that point, I know that they're under Roman empire, uh, uh, Roman rule, but these are the only leaders that they have in their nation are the scribes and the Pharisees and the, the lawyers and, and all that stuff. And, and he's getting right in their face and he's calling them fools and he's calling them hypocrites and they, he's calling them all these things because, you know, they are not living according to the, the word of God. They're not doing the things that he has been. And these should be the leaders. They should be the spiritual leaders, but they've rejected him and they've uh, gone into their own lust and all. And so he's calling them out. You know, a good, uh, you know, a good friend of mine coming down preaching. Pastor Anderson is coming down and preaching uh, after the potluck. And I'm going to tell you, I can't I tell you how many people t- tell me you listen to his preaching. Like, have you heard some of, do you know how hateful he is? And I'm like, you know, hey, I'm not going to say I agree with everything that he's preached or everything that he's ever said. It would be ridiculous to say that about any preacher, okay? But here's one thing I'm not going to be like, oh, I don't know, I think he's a little too hard of a preacher for me. I think he shouldn't call out preachers, you know, that are that are preaching false gospels or preachings that are preachers that are covering up sex scandals or something like that. I think he ought to just leave them alone. What in the world? That's literally the job of a preacher. That's literally the job of a man of God to call out sin and expose it. And, show. and so people will do that and they'll say, oh, don't you know how hateful he is? And I'm like, well, how about we just say, what does the Bible say? Is he right? Is he preaching what the Bible says or is he not? And if he's not preaching what the Bible says, then I'll say, okay, he's wrong on that and I'll, and, and I'll correct him on that. Okay, but here's the thing. So few preachers have the guts to do anything like that. So few preachers would get up and call out, Uh, a a well-known pastor who writes a lot of books and has a a church of 2,000, 3,000, 10,000. I don't know how big the churches are. You know, few preachers want to call somebody like that out. Now, they'll call out a Joel Osteen. Hey, I call him out all all the time, right? Because that's easy. He's not going to do anything to me. (laughs) He's far away. He doesn't know who I am, right? But what about people who you do know who are influential and, uh, and you say that, you know, you call out their preaching or you call out one of their sins or something like that. And next thing you know, hey, you're banned. You're not welcomed in our circles anymore, you know, because, you know, we're going to we're, we're going to do everything we can to stop you, to, to silence you. These are the kind of people that John the Baptist was was preaching to. These are the kind of people that Jesus was preaching to. These are the kind of people that John the Baptist, I mean, uh, that Elijah was preaching to. You see a common thread here, a common trend Okay, this is why they saw John the Baptist and said, hey, this is, looks like Elijah. I mean, this, you know, this reminds us of Elijah. Why they saw Jesus and said, that reminds us of John the Baptist and of Elijah, because there were some similarities, all right? So not only do uh, we have a continua- continuation of the, Elijah, of the spirit of Elijah in John the Baptist himself, but then we have the spirit of Elijah in those who are similar to Elijah, and finally, uh, we have the spirit of Elijah in those who have what, Eli- what it was that Elijah had. You see, here's the thing. Are we really elevating Elijah, who's just a man, who's just an instrument of God? There wasn't anything special about Elijah. Look, do you remember Elijah running into the cave and hiding and saying, I just want to quit, I just want to die, it was better if I wasn't born? That was the human, Elijah. <laughs> So when he preached boldly and he preached, you know, these things that offended people and these things that got, you know, him sought after, they wanted to kill him and all that, it wasn't him. It wasn't him. The spirit of Elijah wasn't the spirit of Elijah at all. The spirit of Elijah was the spirit of the Lord. Okay, now this is something that is mentioned over and over in the Bible, the spirit of the Lord, okay? And I said earlier how the spirit of Elijah dwelling among somebody else is kind of a unique situation. You know, and I talked about the spirit of the Antichrist. We see that. Okay, but one thing we do see as well is the spirit of Christ. Let's go to, let's see if I can figure out where I wrote this down. Uh, man, I hope, I maybe I didn't write it down. Maybe I didn't write it down. I'm sorry. Let me see here. I'm looking for...
Talk amongst yourselves. Okay. Go to... I had to cheat here. Good. I thought this would be easy. Hold on. Okay, Romans 8, 9. Sorry, I should have known that. Romans 8. I'm looking at the conclusion, and I forgot to write down the main scripture. All right. <clears throat> Romans 8. Let's start with verse 6. Romans 8, verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is subject, it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. See how he's talking about the Spirit and you're thinking Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit and all this. But then he also calls it this, the Spirit of Christ. And he says, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're not his. Verse 10, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now look, we walk around this earth with human bodies, flesh and blood, if we're saved, inside we've got the spiritual man. And when the Bible talks about walking in the Spirit, what it means is you have got to deny the flesh, you've got to deny your own desires, and deny the things that are going to hinder you from doing what God would have you to do, and walk according to that inner man that's born again, and walk and do what the Bible tells you to do, uh, because that's what the Holy Spirit is all about. The Holy Spirit's going to lead you and guide you and direct you according to God's Word. And you know what's interesting, if you, you know, read about all the prophets throughout the whole Bible, they all shared that same, some of those same characteristics. And the thing was, it's not like they were copying each other. You know, it's not like God was just giving the, you know, Eli Elisha, what does he say before Elijah goes up? He says, I want a double portion of your spirit, right? But he's not like really getting a supernatural infilling of, you know, like, uh, like, like Elijah was just kind of his spirit was just like divided up and they said, here, we'll give you some of Elijah's spirit. It didn't work that way. Okay. But what he did is he went by the same spirit, you know, the, according to the God of Elijah. And he went with a double portion of his, of his spirit, like a double kind of filling, if you will, of the Holy Spirit. And in order to do that, he has to deny his flesh and he needs to walk in the spirit. And that's what all of us can do. All right. And all of a sudden you'll find out that people that are spirit, led and they're filled with the spirit and they deny the flesh they're all going to do some things that are very similar and they're going to line up very similarly you know not exactly uh, you know there might be some differences but ultimately people will be like hey that guy's a lot like this other guy over here you know and there's people around the world you know that uh, that have that same spirit and it's a similar thing if you look at the reverse of that you know those who have the spirit of antichrist very similar. Those who have, who, those who are following Satan, you know, they won't, they wouldn't say they're following Satan, but anybody that's denying Christ and they're not following God, they're following Satan in one form or another. And you know what happens? They all start looking the same. You're talking to somebody who claims to be a Catholic, you know, claims to be a Christian and they're Catholic. Some Catholics don't even say that they're Christian. They say, no, I'm not a Christian. I'm a Catholic. But, but if you think about like what they're teaching, you know, it's a lot of times you're like, you know what? That seems a lot more like Eastern religion. You know, it's like a Buddhist or something like that. And then you're talking to, you know, these guys. We met, like I was, like I was telling you earlier, we we've met several people who claim to be pagan. I mean, you remember the god of Odin? We talked about. We we met somebody here in uh, in Kansas City uh, who said, "I worship Odin." Well, I've met more than more than a couple in uh, in, in around Iola area who mentioned that same thing, you know, and they talked about Odin. But as they begin describing different things, you're like, you know what, that sounds a whole lot like this other false religion. And all of a sudden, everything just starts sounding the same. Why? Because they have the spirit of Antichrist. You know, they have the spirit of the devil. Why should everything, why do, do those who follow Christ and they deny the flesh and they preach the truth of God's word, why do they all look the same? Because they have the same spirit. 
So the spirit of Elijah continues. It continues on in John the Baptist as we read that. That's why I like the fact that we're called Baptists, even though that might not actually come from John the Baptist. But it's like, hey, yeah, we're, we're carrying on John, what John the Baptist did, okay? Uh, there is some truth there. And, uh, and also by those who are similar to Elijah. And again, it's not because we're emulating Elijah or emulating John the Baptist. You could say we're emulating Jesus Christ, but basically it's because we have the Spirit of Christ. We have the Spirit within us, okay? And then finally... Well, that is, the, that is the conclusion, okay? So the spirit of Elijah is in those who have what Elijah had, which is the Holy Ghost, all right? And it's not, you know, the, it's not the, the Bible college, you know? Am I against Bible college? Not in every situation. But, you know, it's not that, hey, everybody comes out of that Bible college. They look the same way. You know, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're filled with the spirit. But anybody can come out of a different Bible college or whatever who is filled with the spirit and who does preach like an Elijah or a John the Baptist, or whatever, and you're saying, hey, man, these guys are similar. Well, it has nothing to do with the education that they got, the place that they went, maybe even the church that they went to. What it has to do with the fact that they humbled themselves and they submitted to God and they're following His Word and, uh, and they're going to they're gonna just tell the truth. They're going to tell it boldly and uh, be confrontational. That doesn't mean be ugly and be a jerk, but they're going to confront something and say, hey, the only way this is going to be fixed is if we confront this. And then they're going to take that boldly in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for great men of God uh, that have gone before us and that you have used as vessels, Lord, and filled with your spirit so that they might do great works. Help us not fear man, uh, but help us fear uh, you and fear any uh, judgment you'd bring upon us by following after the world and following our own flesh. Uh, help us as your children, Lord, to just serve you, to empty ourselves and to walk in your spirit. And I uh, pray that you would uh, uh, bless accordingly. If not in this life, Lord, we wait for the blessings that come in, uh, in eternity. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.